who's standing to my left. Um, you may be seated. Uh, we previously <coughs> had hard argument yesterday evening about numerous exhibits. A uh, number of exhibits were allowed in. Some were ex excluded this morning. There was a question uh, remaining about uh, people's proposed exhibit 133 and people's proposed exhibit 153. People's proposed exhibit 153, um, we heard argument about it, it's the court's ruling that this exhibit does not qualify under any hearsay exception. It's the same ruling and sa for the same reason uh, that exhibit 118 was excluded. And then as it pertains to exhibit 133, I broke this exhibit down into two parts. The first one is the Tuesday 10 a.m. I have to go to my kids' school counselor just called and this is what I'm dealing with I'll be back by 11 30 to 12 at the latest with a picture of the math homework and that was a text between uh, co-defendant uh, Miss Jennifer Crumley and um, her friend and um, I don't find that this text relevant um, to the case of James Crumley um, so I'm going to uh, exclude it, except the prosecutor may raise it if it's uh, necessary for some reason an impeachment such as chronology or an, a, a uh, knowledge issue. So if if it's necessary to impeach some other evidence that's admitted, I, I'd reconsider that issue. With regard to the bottom uh, part of this exhibit, again, plaintiff's exhibit uh, 133, on Tuesday at 1.23 p.m. Um, as an offer of proof, the prosecutors uh, indicated they'd be, able to in, in, they'd be able to demonstrate that there was an active shooter alert and that subsequent to that, the defendant um, is calling his wife, Mrs. Crumley, from their home and that while Mrs. Crumley is on the phone with her husband, she is texting her friend uh, presumably under while well, under the influence of the startling event that there's an active shooter in the school that Mr. Crumley is at the home. She's on the home. She's on the phone with Mr. Crumley and contemporaneous with her conversation with Mr. Crumley. She texts the gun is gone and so are the bullets and OMG Andy he's going to kill himself and he must be the shooter. So I'll be allowing those uh, text messages in pursuant to 8032. All right. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. So are you ready for the jury? Yes, Judge. You are so broke, okay? All right, go ahead, pass it. Thank you. Sir, we were talking about when you arrived at Oxford High School on November the 30th and you went to the security office. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and tell us again, what was your primary responsibility at that point in time? Was to try to secure the video that, of what had happened in the hallway where the shooting started. And you said that there were a number of cameras operational in Oxford High School? That yes, yes, there was. Okay. So, 
in securing the video, what specifically were you asked to do? We weren't really asked to do anything. We just, I assumed what the bosses, the, the, the sheriff and the under all of them would want to know um, is where it started. Uh, we knew it started in the 200 hallway um, and we saw as the shooter came out, but we were trying to figure out when he went into the bathroom. So what did you do to accomplish this goal? The shooter came out of the bathroom with a black coat on. Uh, we kept on you know, rewinding five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and watched all the way through looking for him to go into the bathroom. And we didn't know the shooter's name at the time. Um, then we could never find somebody going into the bathroom wearing what the shooter had when he came out. Um, and somebody told us who, what his name was. And so we had knew that he was in the counselor's office earlier in the day. So we went all the way back to the time he was coming out of the counselor's office to determine what he was wearing before he went to the bathroom. That's how we were able to figure out when he did go in. Okay, so you were able to eventually identify the shooter? Yes. <clears throat> now, are you the, the person who actually synced together the camera footage for other investigators? Yes, I was. Okay, and tell me, how was it that you were able to do that? With over 100, at least 100 cameras in the school, you just take clips of each one. And as they move from one camera, you go to the next camera and save that section. And then there's software that I use to just thread them all together. And then you, you testified earlier that, that um, you were aware that um, the shooter was in his counselor's office. Were you also aware that James and Jennifer Crumbly went to Oxford High School that day? At that time, I yes, I was. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. And eventually were you requested to obtain as much surveillance video footage from that point in time as you could? Yes. Your Honor, I'm okay. going to object to leading. It's just foundational time. All right, sustain. Now, in the immediate days after the shooting, what was your primary responsibility with regard to the video? Uh, different things came up. Uh, there was a rumor going around that the shooter had actually tried opening doors, you know, and identifying himself as the police. Well, that was actually the police, but I had to go up there and get more video footage just to determine how far he went completely down the hallway before he turned around. Um, and then what had happened uh, in the surrounding hallways and such like that. And as the investigator, we had to put, sync together the, the video. Did you have to watch the video of the shooting itself? Yes, sir. All told, how many hours of video do you think you've watched to put this together? Too many. How many different angles did you have to see this from? Every angle, every every camera. There's some cameras that pointed back in one direction from where that it started to. I don't know. I don't know. Seven different angles, maybe different times. In part of putting that footage together, were you aiding in the identification of the victims? Yes. Tell us what you saw in that video. Started at 12.51. The shooter came out of the bathroom. I'll never forget it. He came out of that bathroom like what I've referred to before in other in my life, like, like a proud chest, like his shoulders were back. And he comes out of the bathroom and there's Phoebe and her boyfriend just standing right there. And he takes the gun he, as he comes out of the bathroom and he turns and levels the gun and fires at Phoebe and hits her in the shoulder and fires at her boyfriend, um, hitting him in his hand as he raises his hand from seeing the gun, I would imagine. Um, then to his right, immediately, right there, uh, was um, Hannah St. Juliana and Kylie and, and Riley. And he, uh, he started shooting at them, and they fell on top of each other. And in the distance, in the camera, you can see uh, the far end of the angle. You see what I found out to be was uh, Madison Baldwin, and she uh, she like, she crouched down like I don't know if it was I don't know if it was in 
I don't know why she did it, but it was in the fetal position. And the shooter ran right up to her. And uh, he put the gun right under her head. She just fell over. You, uh, he rounds the corner into the longer part of the 200 hallway. Prior to running the, towards Madison, he had just fired down the hallway, just, I don't know, just trying to hit anybody that was running out of there. He rounds the corner and starts shooting. You see a whole bunch of kids. You see a, you see a whole bunch of teachers standing at doors, just grabbing kids as they ran by and just throwing them into a room. And then, uh, there's two girls, one you see, she, she runs up to a door and tries pulling it open, but the people inside had already put the safety latch at the bottom of the door and she couldn't get it open. Meanwhile, the shooter's still walking towards and another girl comes from the right side of the frame and grabs the other one by the arm and just tears off down the hallway. Meanwhile, the shooter is shooting at them. The shooter continues, keeps walking down the hallway past uh, 200, I think it was a 400 T intersection, I think is what that was. Um, and he, he, he levels the gun. And he fires two rounds, and at first I didn't know what he was shooting at. And then when you go to the section of video of that time was, is when, uh, when Tate Muir just comes in and on. Unknowing to him, he had no idea what had happened, what was happening. And the shooter leveled the gun and just as Tate turned the corner, the shooter fired around. And Tate fell instantly. The shooter took a couple steps, and then leveled the gun again. And just to just to shoot Tate again, laying there, shot him. And you see Tate's body flinch. He then, uh, he then walks over Tate. Um, at the top of the frame, you see his feet stop, the shooter's feet, and he turns towards a room that, looking at the frame, would be on the left or would have been his left. Um, and come to find later on, he had fired into a classroom where a teacher was. He continues on down the hallway, um, almost hunting for more victims or, or whatever. And he gets past a certain point and there's no one else to shoot at because everybody had ran out of the school. They, every door, every possibility, every lock, door locked, whatever. And you see him turn around and he stops at a classroom that based on where the door is, you can't see deep into the, deep into the room. It's like the room goes that way, but he can only see straight in. Well, as he's walking back this way, he can see the kids, I'm imagining, hiding in that corner because he stops and fires off a few rounds through the glass. He then uh, comes back, walking towards where Tate was lying. Um, at this time, uh, an assistant principal was laying there or standing there uh, next to Tate. And sh the shooter just walks past her with the gun in his hand and she said something to him. I'm not sure what she said, but you could tell like he turned his head, like almost didn't even look at her, turned his head like in, in shame. I don't know. Um, and then he keeps on walking down the hallway to uh, the bathroom where the uh, uh, the other victim, Justin Schilling was. Um, and he just, as he gets to the bathroom, he just stops and turns right and just goes right to the bathroom. <clears throat> did the shooter eventually exit the bathroom? Yes, he did. Before he did, did somebody else exit the bathroom? Yes, another student. Tell me what you saw there. That student, he was, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but I've never seen somebody, never seen somebody actually run for their life. And that kid was running for his life. 
And did the shooter eventually exit the bathroom himself? Yes, he does. Tell me about that. He comes out of the bathroom and he looks around a little bit, see what's going on. Um, turns around and uh, the, the, the bathroom, the doors sit back in like a cubby type area, so they're off the hallway, the main hallway you really can't see, but he turns back around. And eventually now, um, the two first responding deputies um, had got him, Jason Lewer and Jens, um, were coming down the hallway. And Lewer was a little bit faster than Jens was just because he was trying to cover more ground. You can see Tate laying on the ground. Um, and Jens is walking a little bit slower as, as he's walking up to him, the shooter just puts his hands up in the air and then goes down to his knees. As he's doing that, Jens realizes he sees something and he, I, he yells, he yelled gun from what he told me. Um, and the shooter then lays down on his stomach and Jason Lure come back and that's where they take him to custody right there. Based upon your, your video review, and you said you've had to watch hours of this? Yes, sir. Is it fair to say that the entire incident was about nine minutes long? Yes, sir. Yeah. He was taken in custody at 1300. That's one, one o'clock. I'm sorry. What was, sorry at 1251. He was taken in custody at 1 p.m. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I'm going to go through some of the evidence that you recovered in your um, forensic in, uh, investigation. We talked about different information that you were able to draw upon from James Crumbly's phone, Jennifer Crumbly's phone, and the shooter's phone, as well as their social media accounts and emails. Yes, right? that's correct. So you've seen all of the bits of every exhibit in this case you've seen, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you've seen the demonstrative portions of those exhibits in this PowerPoint. PowerPoint before too. Correct. Okay. So you're aware, and everyone's aware, we have a citation with the evidence uh, number on that slide, as well as a citation to where from um, these sources of electronic information was pulled from. Correct. Okay. Yes. Now, from what you've reviewed of the exhibits, do they fairly and accurately depict? the information that you extracted from the social media accounts and from the devices themselves? Yes, it does. They do. So we'll start in um, late winter or early spring of 2021. Mr. Keese, can I just ask you, this, this source of electronic information, which exhibit is this specifically? This is not an exhibit. This is just a demonstrative aid for oh, okay. the research. All right. Thank you. So we'll start with um, March 8th. 2021. Before we get into that, a little bit of background. You were able to obtain a Facebook Messenger chat between James and Jennifer Crumley? That's correct. And, and tell, me, tell me how you were able to obtain that. Uh, uh, you, we talked to earlier, you can send search warrants off um, after authorization from a judge to obtain information on someone's social media accounts or phone numbers. Okay. And did that happen in this case? Yes, it did. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what's been admitted as this is people's 44. Sir, what are we looking at here? That's a Facebook chat from between James and Jennifer and the green would be James Crumbly and the blue would be Jennifer's. Okay, uh, so yeah. we won't do this with every slide, but just so we are on the same page here. It says from Facebook 69147344 JC Rumbly. What does that mean? The numbers is the um, ID account that is signed by Facebook. And then the JC Rumbly is the screen name that was chosen by the user. Okay. And then we have in the, the bottom of the text bubble, we have the date. So this is March 8, 2021. The time, 3.09.50 p.m. And then it says UTC-5. What is that? The, it's just to tell you that it's been adjusted. So the, the normal information is captured um, in, in UTC time, minus zero. The you know, time starts in uh, the point uh, in Greenwich. It used to be called Greenwich Mean Time GMT. Well, now it's UTC, uh, Universal, like whatever it means. Anyways, all the time starts there. Depending on which way you go from that point on the globe is whether it's plus hours or minus hours. And we're five hours away from where all time starts. So let's go through this 
conversation. Blue from Jennifer. Ethan going to bowling. What's in green is James. Correct. What's the response there? IDK or I don't know. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, what do you mean? I don't know. Um, and what was James' response? James says, I don't know, period. Exactly what I said, period. We'll know after he gets home. Okay. And Jennifer's response, 3.12 p.m., does he have his phone? Again, 3.12 p.m., why isn't he home yet? 3.12 p.m., he should be home by now. Correct. Okay. And Jennifer, 3.12 p.m. and 56 seconds, says freaking out. What was James' response? He does not get home till 3.16. So March 8, 2021, that was a weekday from the combination of the digital evidence that you reviewed, vacation history, were you able to tell where James was when he was sending this message? Yes. Where's that? He was at home. And Jennifer's response, I told you to pick him up because he's upset and I don't want him to do anything stupid, God damn it. Correct. That's March 8th at 3.13 p.m.? Correct. Okay. And James's response? Dude, period, chill, period, he is fine, period, and I'm trying to fucking work. I'm going to move on to, again, March 8th, 3.13 p.m., what does Jennifer say? Jennifer replies with, does he have his phone? Question mark, question mark, question mark. And James' response? Yes, but he won't answer while he is walking. I will let you know the minute he walks in. Right. And Jennifer at 3.14 p.m. says what? I'm seriously, serious freaking out. Then she says, is he home yet? And that was three minutes later. That's March, again, March 8th, 2021. It was Monday. It was 3.17 p.m.? Yes, correct. I'm going to move on to Exhibit 61. Again, James and Jennifer Facebook messages. Blue will always be Jennifer, is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. March 19th, 9.37 a.m. Um, tell us what Jennifer writes, please. Jennifer writes, Ethan, awake. Okay, James' response. Um, yeah. Jennifer? Replies with, how is he? And what does James say? James then says, he woke up, looking like he had way, in all caps, too much to drink last night, complaining about a headache. That's March 19th, 2021. Uh, 9 40 a.m. What does Jennifer write? She replied with, Well, he was really worked up and out of control, so I can see why. She continues on with, All I know is he needs to eat, go to work, work hard, and not complain. Then get his stuff back. And that was at 9 41 a.m. Okay. At 10 15, uh, Jennifer says, You respond. I didn't get a call. I didn't get it. Okay. And James's response? He responds back with, One text says, Jesus. Another one says, Yes. Okay. He said, let me ask you a question. Why am I in your guy's room? LOL. And that was at March 19, 21, 10, 17 a.m.? Correct. And uh, Jennifer's response? OMG. Oh, my God. Uh, what did James write? James responds, I totally thought you were giving him a Xanax last night. Jennifer's response? She responded with, does he seem better? Then a second response, uh, no melatonin. Okay, and what did James say? He responds back with, I know. Jennifer's response at 10, 18 a.m., please. Jennifer said, but he hasn't had one before. Should have only given him half. And what did James say? He is just doing his school, says his head hurts. He took so Tylenol. Okay, and Jennifer wrote, is he okay to work? Correct, she did. And, and then James, James responds back with, yeah. Okay. And what did Jennifer write at March 19th, 21, 11.38 a.m.? Does he remember what he did? And what did James say? James responds back with, dude, I am working on a demo right now. I have not talked to him, and he is doing school. Okay, Jennifer's response? She responds back with, okay, then, jeesh. Now you've reviewed the entire phone seized from the shooter. Correct. Okay. Did one text message conversation stand out to you compared to the rest? Yes. Okay. And tell me why did it stand out? Just the volume of text messages back and forth, the amount that there was in, in just one chat. Okay. Now without telling us the person with whom the shooter was 
is texting with that volume. Um, can you tell us if you came to learn that the person who was texting was the same age? Yes, it okay. was. And he went to school with him? Correct. All right. Um, tell us about the approximate number of text messages between the shooter and his friend. There was over 20,000 text messages between the two from January to the middle end of October. Okay. So that sounds like a lot to me, but I'm not an expert in computer forensics. Give us an idea of what that, that scope is. 20,000. I mean, that print is over 5,000 pages of text. Um, I've I've examined phones that someone's entire chat conversation with everybody they have is less than 20,000. So it, it's just a, a large volume. To put in a comparison between, let's say, James and Jennifer's Facebook conversations, right? what's the scope and the difference in size there, I think? I believe James and Jennifer was 10,000, 10,000 text messages back and forth okay. for that same time frame. So same, same time frame, we have double the amount of text message communication between the shooter and his friend is James and Jennifer Kermit. Correct. Okay. You said January to October. Is that both 2021? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Thank you, Judge. Yes, 2021? Yes. No, there were also, without going into detail, video shared as well? Yes, there was. Okay. And were some of the content, the content of the conversation, the highly personal nature? Yes, it was. Now, in comparison to any other conversation on the shooter's phone, What's the difference in size between that particular text thread with everybody else's on the shooter's phone? He had he had over twenty thousand text messages with that with his one friend, and in comparison, there was between anybody else, there was a combined I, I want to say less than a thousand between anybody else anybody else that he had chatted with. So combined, less than a thousand. Yes, and then that. One friend was twenty over twenty thousand. Correct. Now I'm going to show you just a very small portion of that, uh, specifically April the fourth and April the fifth of two thousand twenty-one, which would be right about two weeks after the messages that we just saw between James and Jennifer Crumley. This has been admitted as Exhibit sixty-seven. Names are redacted, obviously. Um, Green is the shooter. Correct. Okay. Uh, tell us what the shooter wrote April 4th, 2021, 11.56 at night. Types, like I hear people talking to me and see someone in the distance and then he appears to try to correct the spelling of the word distance. Okay. And April 4th, 2021, 11.56 and 50 seconds, what does he write? I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. And 11.57 p.m., what did he write? He continues on with, like, it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor. And then he says, my mom laughed when I told her. That was, again, 11.57 in the evening, April the 4th, 21? Correct. April 5th, 2021, this is just after midnight. What does he write? He tells his friend, but I am having bad insomnia right now, RN, and paranoia. And then what does he write? I need help. That's at 12.11 a.m.? Correct. And then at 12, 12 a.m., what is he right? I was thinking by calling 911 too so I could go to the hospital. And continuing on April 5th, 12, 12 a.m., what does he write? But then my parents would be really pissed. And finally, 12.38 a.m., what does he write? He says, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. Then he continues with, but this time I'm going to tell them about the voices. And finally, he writes at 12.39 and 20 seconds, what? Like I am mentally and physically dying. Now, you discovered, we just mentioned, some videos on this text message thread between the shooter and that friend. Is that right? That's correct. So I'm going to now direct you to August the 19th of 2021. First of all, did some of those images that he shared depict firearms? Yes, they did. Okay. So this is exhibit 70 and 71. 70 is the text message itself. And what are we looking at here? That's uh, showing a video was sent to his friend. Okay. So it's the same friend we're referring to at all times. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. August 19th, 2021, 9.31 p.m. Yeah. And the video is 71. I'm going to play that now.
Now that's August 19th, 2021. Um, do you know what, what he was handling in his hand? There was a handgun. This is exhibit 72 and 73. They've both been admitted. This is 8.20 a.m. at 12.30 in the morning. So we're carrying over past midnight from the last video. Um, 72 is this text bubble. So what are we seeing here? Again, it's a text to his friend that he's been communicating with um, of another video of the gun. Okay. And this indicates that video was sent to his friend? Correct. I'm going to play 73 now. Now, sir, do we see a round in that chamber? Yes, there is. Okay, when I say round in the chamber, what does that mean? A, a bullet and a, and a shell. And that was August the 20th. Now, were you able to tell if the defendant or Jennifer Crumbly were actually inside the home when the video was taken? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go through. Let me talk earlier about how you're able to find certain uh, location history. Correct. Okay. So is it fair to say that you were able to do that for this specific date? That's correct, yes. So this is exhibit 74. Green, and so we're aware, green will always be James Crumley's location. Purple will be Jennifer Crumley. Okay. Um, what are we looking at here in exhibit 74? Uh, that's a GPS location that was captured by Google. Uh, is, is the Gmail account, jamescrumbly8 at gmail.com in the upper right corner. Um, and on August 19th at 9.21 p.m. Okay, so that's that's on East Street. Did you come to learn that the Crumley family lived at 112 East in Oxford? Yes, I did. Okay. So that indicates at least that his device is at the location approximately the time the first video on August 19th was taken. Correct. Okay. So this is Exhibit 75. This is purple. Again, so this would be Jennifer Crumley? Correct. Tell us, please, what you see here. Uh, again, it's uh, using the same uh, Gmail account that they had. Uh, her GPS location from Google was at 9.29 p.m. on August 19th. Okay. And again, that's the first video that we saw. Correct. This is Exhibit 76, specifically August the 20th, 2021. 12.32 a.m. What do we see here? Again, another green circle indicating the location of James's device. Okay. And this is approximately the same time the video of the loaded gun was sent. Correct. Here's 77. What are we looking at here? That's the purple, which is Jennifer's um, on August 20th, and that's at 12.21 a.m. Now, this is exhibit 72. This is part of that same conversation between the shooter and his friend? Yes. Okay. And this was August 20th, 21 at 12.32 a.m.? Correct. Okay. So would that be right after that video was sent? That's correct. All right. What is the shooter write? My dad left it out, so I thought, why not? LOL. Okay. Now, during the course of your investigation, did you come to learn that this friend, the shooter, was communicating? communicating with abruptly left the state of Michigan. Yes. Okay. And did you learn if that was done without notice to the shooter? Correct, it was not. Okay, what do you base that belief on? Um, James had reached out to the father of um, the shooter's friend, asking if everything was okay, and then the father of the friend told what, what was going on. I'm gonna show you exhibit 79. This is a text message from, you recovered off of James Crumley's phone? Correct. Okay, and again, names are redacted here. Did Correct. you come to learn that this is the father of the shooter's friend? Yes. Okay. And what's the date here? This is on October 30th, uh, 2021. Okay, and 9.52 p.m., what did he write? He wrote, hey Mark, sorry for the late text. Hope the family is well. Just wanted to check in and make sure everything is okay with uh, the shooter's friend. Ethan has been trying to get a hold of him for a few days. Did not know if his phone was taken away, maybe, but just checking in. Ethan wanted to be with his friend for Halloween if he is okay. Okay. Now, we have this in the same conversation for context. This is October 30th, 21, 11.01 p.m. This was in response to that text? Correct. Okay. And what does he say? He says, hey, James, thanks for checking in on him. Unfortunately, it, his friend is in a bad place with the OC... OCD, unable to go to school most of the, this week. We are taking him out to Wisconsin tomorrow to put him in residential treatment. He'll be gone for 60 to 90 days. 
by far the hardest decision we've had to make. So he probably doesn't know how to approach it with Ethan or what to say. I think he was probably embarrassed about the situation and is the reason he is not answering. Let me talk to a friend. I, was, I wasn't aware that he wasn't talking to anyone. Okay. And then there was another text after? Yes. It, uh, he responded, sorry for the delayed response. Okay. And 1030, 21 at, at 11.03 p.m.? The father of the friend says, let me talk to him and see how he wants to approach it with Ethan. Okay. And then what is James' response? James responds with, Mark, please let me know if there's any way at all we can help. He is a great kid and always great over here and very welcome at all times. Please let me know if we can help. So that's October 30th, 2021, 11, 10 p.m. Correct. Now, I want to talk to moving to November of 2021. Did you find any information regarding James Crumbly's employment status? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell us specifically, specifically regarding November of 21, what did you find? That he had lost his job on the first of the month. Okay. And did he subsequently find another job? Yes, he did. And do you recall when that was? Uh, shortly thereafter, he uh, started uh, door dashing. Okay. This is exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, we're still on page uh, exhibit 79, the response to James Crumley's text was what? Oh, he's, uh, the dad of the friend says, thank you, he loves you guys. Hopefully we can get him better and Ethan can spend some time over here too. He has to voluntarily go, so there's a chance he may not be admitted. If you don't mind for now, if Ethan asks, tell him he had to go out of town unexpectedly. If he gets admitted, then we can give him full disclosure. Is that all right? So here's exhibit 81. This is the you mentioned he was door dashing? Correct. Okay. And you executed, well, you were part of the investigators who obtained information from DoorDash via search warrant? Yes. Okay. And the DoorDash, if you are a driver for DoorDash, you can sell an application on your phone? Correct. And did James Trimley have that on his phone? Yes, he did. Okay. okay. And so what is this in 81? That's just from uh, one of the things that is pulled out when we extract data, pull data off the phone. It's installed applications, and it just tells us that that app was installed, the Dasher app was installed on his phone on November 9th. Okay. So that's when he would have put the application on the phone to start receiving orders to be a door dash driver. Correct. So this is November 9th, 2021 at 8.35 p.m. Correct. All right. Uh, did you come to learn that he also received messages when he logged in and began picking up orders? Yes. Did you find any evidence to suggest that he worked anywhere else but DoorDash in the month of November of 2021? No, I did not. And based upon his location history and other information you obtained from his phone, did you come to learn if when he did work beforehand, he was away from the house or in the home? He was in the home. Now, what about the shooter's digital footprint in the month of November 2021 after his friend left? When you reviewed the phone, the shooter's phone for that month in particular, did you find any evidence of the shooter being in contact with anybody else, any other peer? No, he did not communicate with hardly anybody at all. Any evidence, either GPS pings, pictures, social media posts, text messages, anything to suggest that he met up with anybody outside of school? No, if I remember correctly, there was for the whole month of November, there was only 48 total text messages from the 1st to the 30th. Okay. And what did those text messages and text messages include? Co uh, combined six of them were to James and Jennifer. And then the rest were, I remember seeing, he was accessing some app, maybe doing homework or something, trying to find, you know, it, it appeared like he would text it, maybe a math problem or something, it would send you the answer. I'm not entirely certain, but that's what it looked like. Okay. But no evidence of plans to meet with a friend outside of school or no or anything like that? Ask the answer. I don't think I asked that one. Keep going. Okay. No, sir. Um, when I talk about cached data, what does that term mean? Cached data is data that's stored in a temporary file for your device, whether it's a phone or a computer, to pull that information back up again quickly. Um, whether it's recently viewed or something you look at a lot, the computer can do it quicker because it knows it has to go to this one folder instead of re-downloading it. 
Okay. So so I understand it. Does that mean if if it's does that phone every phone have a certain area of storage of cache data? Yes, and every app just if depending on what the app is, it would have its own folder of cache data, yes. Okay. So if there's something, for example, an image in cache data, what does that indicate to you as a forensic examiner? It would imply that someone had to, it would have to been on their phone, they would have to have seen it. Okay. Now, what does it mean if two people have the same cache data on their phone for an image? One either would have sent it to the other one or they randomly looked at the same picture. When examining the phone of the shooter and examining the phone of James Crumbly, did you find any images in common in cache data? Yes. Now I want to specifically take you to exhibits 82 and 83. So the extraction report and a screenshot. So first of all, 82 is the extraction report. This is a snippet of that, please. Tell yes. me, tell me what that means. On 82? Yes. The, where the file info is and stuff? Yes. That shows the, the name of the image when either, either you take a screenshot of something, it's going to name it real quickly, um, or if you receive it, it'll name it real quickly so it can track it within your, uh, your device. And then where it says path, that's the file path that, that often tells you what happened, how something got on a computer, on a phone, is by reading the file path. So let's talk about file path for a second. Now, anytime you, as a, an expert in computer forensics and cell phone forensics, you're looking to find how a piece of data got on a phone. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And so how does a file path aid you in that? It just tells, that right there, it tells us what they, like this one, for example, on the screen, it says Android messaging. I know this was done using the Android messaging app. Okay, so this is from the shooter's phone, and the file path you said had Android messaging? Correct. At, um, at the, the second line from the top, it says tar archive, and then data slash, and then com, Android messaging slash. Okay. Now, if something is found in cache data as opposed to just scrolling through the phone to find the image, what does that mean to you? That they would have had seen it on their phone before. Okay. But why wouldn't you be able to find it just in messages? Probably if it was deleted. Okay. So this is on the shooter's phone and we have the, I guess, the forensic fo footprint of this image. Correct. And the image itself in Exhibit 83. Correct. Okay. So what is the exhibit itself in 83? That tells you right there, that's a screenshot, because at the top of it, you can see the top part of your phone, usually it has a time up there, and the, the battery life and the antenna strength that you have, you can see it at the top of that image. Okay. So the screenshot here is 1239, um, and we have the extraction report on 82 to verify. It's Monday, the 8th of November, 2021, 1239 p.m., so that matches the screenshot? Correct, it does. And be, because... Exhibit 82 has the actual time and date stamp with the UTC minus five that matches the screenshot. What does that mean to you? That that image, that's the image that was sent with that. Okay. And this was on the shooter's phone. Correct. All right. So this is, um, this also has the file path here at 1240 PM. Tell me what we're looking at here. Uh, this one. So this file path is a little different. Um, again, starting where you see the word path on the screen there, and then going over, um, second line from under TAR archive, it's the uh, tct.cs.rcs. And the RCS tells me that that is um, rich content, and it's that's Android's way of being able to either share large files to know. Um, a lot of people have an Apple phone, you can tell when someone's texting you back. That RCS feature allows Android phones to do the same thing. Okay, so as a forensic examiner, you can tell us that that screenshot was sent by the defendant's phone based upon, by the shooter's phone based upon the file path? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now here's exhibits 85 and 86. This is from James Crumbly's phone. What are we looking at here? Uh, on the right side is, well, I'm sorry, the left side, I apologize, is the extraction information uh, that was given, the name that was given in the file path, and then the screenshot again on the right side. Okay, exhibit 85, the extraction report here. It has the date and time. It's November the 8th, 2021, but this is 1240 p.m. So that's later in time than what was found on the shooter's phone. Correct. Is that right? Correct, about one minute. But it's the same screenshot? Correct, it is. Now, did you find either screenshot of the nine millimeter, well, so price $299.99, 
used Smith & Wesson SD9VE in very good condition. Comes with two 16 round magazines and cleaning kit with an image of a firearm, is that right? Correct. Okay, did you find that screenshot in either messaging from James Crumbly or the shooter? From James Crumbly? Yes. No. Okay. But did you find it anywhere else on the phone other than the cash here? No, I did not. Okay. Have you seen reference to SD9VE 9mm elsewhere in this case? Yes. Where? In the shooter's journal. Okay. And again, because it's found in cache data and nowhere else, what does that mean to you? That it would have had one time been on the phone. It, the, as you're opening the text message, your phone's going to say, I got to save that image so I can look at it if they want to open it up. So the fact that it's in the cache data tells me that they had opened it up okay. to see it. Now, is it possible to recover deleted content from a phone? Potentially. Tell me why. Each Android phones are different. So depending on the manufacturer of the phone, whether you have either a high-end phone or a simple throwaway phone that you buy at Walmart, um, the Android operating system can be changed to suit the manufacturer or the reseller's specifications. So if you want to sell a cheaper-end phone that doesn't have all the functionalities of a higher-end phone, usually doesn't have the features to be able to store longer content or retrieve deleted content. Okay. So it's nothing to do with your forensic tools per se, it's just on the manufacturer? Correct. Is it more likely to recover deleted messages after both users delete the message? No, it's no. Is it more difficult? Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. So the fact that this was found in cache data and nowhere else, is that significant to you? Yes. Why? That it was, it was on the phone at one time and now it's not there. Did all the Crumblies have Androids? Yes, they did. I'm going to direct your attention now to the days before the shooting. We'll start with November the 26th, 2021. Okay. Now, sir, given the, the tools available at your disposal and the information you're able to pull from, um, I'm going to ask you to to build as best you can a digital footprint of the crumblies from the 26th to the 30th. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the, the firearm purchase of the six hour nine millimeter on November the 26th, 2021? Yes. Okay. But based upon data locations and other information that you were able to retrieve in your investigation, are you able to tell us approximately when that purchase occurred? Yes. When? It was between 1 and 2 p.m. Well, I'm going to show you exhibit 87 here. This is data location from 12.08 p.m. on 11.26.21. So what are we looking at right here? That, uh, I apologize. It was between 12 and 1 p.m. They were at the gun range there, or the gun store there. Okay. So this location here verifies that James Crumley's device was at that, that firearm store where the six hours purchased that day? Correct. Yes. Okay. Now this is exhibit 88. This is 12:57 uh, p.m., and we can see East Street as far as where we're oriented towards the map. What are we looking at here? That shows uh, James Crumbly's location relative to his house at 112 East Street. Okay. So, what can you surmise from from these data points? That this one in particular, the larger the circle is, the more um, I don't want to say less accurate. The, the larger the range where the device could be. This one in particular is 62 meters from that point. So he could be anywhere within 62 meters of that point there near his house. Okay. So because we have a, a more narrow point in exhibit 87, we can be reasonably assured that the device was at the firearm store from 1208 and then at 1257 he was getting within 62 meters of his house? Correct. Okay. Now to the extent possible, I'd like us to go through what the Kremlin family did after the purchase of that firearm on November the 26th. <clears throat> Tell us what you saw on their phones, what they did after the gun was purchased. They went uh, Christmas tree shopping. There are pictures of it. Sir, when, when someone takes a picture of something, is there a way to tell where and when that picture was taken? Usually, yes. Tell me why. Uh, usually, so a picture that you take with your phone or even a, a camera that you might have, a Canon camera, um, captures what's called metadata. You usually tell your phone to do it. And metadata is data within data. It's so that the main information here that you see on the screen is uh, of a map. Well, embedded in that could be 
how that map was made by the camera that took the picture, maybe the computer that took the picture, how they even the screenshot was made. That's information that you don't see. That's the metadata. So we're looking at exhibits 89 and 90 here. So 89 is the metadata, 90 is the photograph itself. Tell us what we're looking at here. That's uh, was taken from the shooter's phone. He was holding a handgun that was purchased on the 26th. And the handgun on the the uh, the grip there says six hour. Correct, it is. Okay. And so when and where was this picture taken? This was taken at the Crumbly home on uh, November 26th. And what time? At 1:03 p.m. Okay. So we saw from the, the location history that that James Crumbly was almost at his house at 12:57 p.m. And this photograph was taken six minutes later. Correct. Now, did the shooter post anything on Instagram with regards to this fire? Uh, he posted pictures of, the, of him holding the gun and then um, talking, telling people to ask questions, they'll answer. So here's exhibit 95. What do we see here? That's the Instagram post where the shooter wrote, just got my new beauty today, hard eye emoji, six hour, nine millimeter, ask questions, I will answer. And when was this uh, post made? Uh, in the bottom left corner, you can see it was uh, November 26, 2021, and it says 1806, which is 606 uh, UTC, and that's what I was talking about. We're minus five or four hours, so at, in November, we're minus five hours, so it's staying at 306. All right, here is also exhibit 95. What do you see here? 106. I apologize. It was 106 that was taken. 106. I, minus I was going to correct your math, but... Yes, I apologize. Um, another picture of him holding it in his hand, um, and that was taken shortly after at 1.06 uh, uh, p.m. Okay, so same caption of the post, different photograph? Correct. All right, and here is, uh, again, same same time, same caption? Yes, just looking down the sights of the gun. Okay. We see three dots at the top of the firearm. What is that? Those are the sights of the gun, the two. Um, the two on the, on the outside um, in the front post, if you don't know, um, you line those up, it's called your sight picture. You get those three dots in a line. If you have equal light on either side, it's where your round's gonna go. And he's just practicing lining up the sights. Okay. And that's lined up in a way where it would fire the way you would want it to, that'd be right? It's put around right below it, yeah. And same same caption, just get my new view to today, six hour, nine millimeter, ask any questions I will answer. Correct. Now, were you able to tell if James and Jennifer Crumbly followed this particular Instagram account? Yes, they did. So let's verify that. This is Exhibit 91. Um, this is regards to Jennifer Crumbly. Correct. Okay. And what, what are we looking at right here? This is um, a, a caption, uh, a, a screenshot from the data extraction from um, a Celebrate report. Okay. And this tells you what? It tells me that Jennifer did follow... It shows the username, uh, entry Ethan.crumbly, and that the actual name to it is Ethan Crumbly, following on Instagram. Okay. And here's exhibit 92. This is for James Crumbly? Correct. And same information obtained? Same thing. In the contact column, you can see where interaction status, it says following and a source Instagram. Okay. Were you able to determine if James Crumbly followed his wife, Jennifer Crumbly's social media accounts as well? Yes. Okay. Here's exhibit 93. What are we looking at? Uh, another screenshot of a extraction report. Okay, what does this indicate to you? It shows that uh, JC Rum um, following on Instagram. Okay, With username J E H N C seventy eight. Correct. And this is Exhibit ninety four. What does this show? That shows um, in the contact column JC Rumbly uh, friend on Facebook. So we saw from the location data uh, James arriving home approximately 12.57 p.m., at least in the proximity of the home. And then these photographs taken at 1.03 p.m. And then these posts made shortly thereafter. Is that right? right? Okay, and you said they went Christmas tree shopping after that? Yes. Okay, we're able to tell from location history when that occurred. Yeah, on, on the, I'm sorry, the evening of the 26th. Okay. Now, did you find any other pictures or videos of the murder weapon after they returned home from Christmas shopping? There was one more. And this is exhibit 96. 
This is 6.39 p.m. on November the 26th, 2021. This was found on the defendant's phone, is that right? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, the defendant's son's phone, thank you. Yeah. This, shoot, this is on the shooter. shooter's phone. Based upon your investigation, that was the six hour nine millimeter? Yes, it was. Did you also find a picture on Jennifer's phone of the nine millimeter and another firearm owned by James Kermel? Yes. This is exhibit 97. What are we looking at here? That's the, the six hour at the bottom part of the screen and on top is a Caltech firearm. And then the magazine is in a gun line. So, are you aware of what was provided to James Crumbly when he purchased the weapon on November the 26th? I was, uh, a gun lock was provided in uh, the magazines, the gun. As well as that ATF pamphlet underneath it? Correct. Now the video that we saw, that was taken at um, 6.39 p.m. That's the video on the shooter's phone. Correct. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you exhibit 98 here. This is at 6.27 p.m., November the 26th, James Crumley location. Are you able to tell where he was at that time? He was, uh, the vice shows near his house, at his house. I think to move on to the next day, November the 27th, 2021. Could you get an idea of what the defendant, his wife, and their son were doing that day? Yes. Okay. Now, what of significance to you? Uh, Jennifer and the shooter went to the gun range that day. All right. And were there any uh, social media posts made after the trip to the gun range? Yes. Is that both by the shooter as well as Jennifer Crumbly? Yes, it Direction was. Direction on our leading. Foundation on the we'll, we'll go one by one. Here is, first of all, um, for a timeline, Exhibit 99, what are we looking at here? That the purple is Jennifer and at the house at 1.58 p.m. Right. on the 27th. And here is exhibit 100. What do we see here? That's a uh, the target that was at uh, used at the shooting range, um, posted by the defendant or uh, the shooter. Took my new SIG out to the range today. Definitely need to get used to the new sights. LOL. And date and time when this was posted? That was at 19:02 or 2:02 p.m. And that's November 27th, 21. Correct. Correct. Now. Uh, this is exhibit 101. This is Jennifer Crumbly's Instagram post. What do we see here? Uh, she posted the target that she had shot and posted with it, Mom and Sunday testing out his new Xmas present. My first time shooting a nine millimeter, I hit the bullseye. So that is how close in time in relation to what her son posted? Within one minute. Now this is another photograph here, same post? Yes. Same time? Yes, it is. And finally, what do we see here? That's the six hour handgun right there with the magazines and the pamphlet. So because all three indicate mom and son day testing out his new Xmas present, my first time shooting a nine millimeter, I hit the bullseye. Does that indicate those three pictures were posted together? Yes, they were. Well, here's exhibit 102 here. This is a this is two o three p.m. What do we see here? This is uh, Jennifer uh, at her house at nine twenty seven at two o three p.m. Okay, and so that's approximately the same time those photographs, those posts were, were um, those images were posted. Correct. So the fact that they were posted on her device or her social media accounts through her device, and we have a device location here. What does that mean to you? That she was at her house when she made that post. And were you able to tell if James Crumbly saw these images? Yes. Here's exhibit 103. What are we looking at here? This is um, extra data information from the cell phone extraction. And again, back to the file path that I talked about, you can see the third line down in the second column. You see um, tom.facebook.katana slash cache, showing, indicating that it's in the cache folder. Okay. So like the, the screenshot of a uh, Smith & Wesson 9mm sent by his son to him. These images were also found in the cache folder? Correct. Now, 
Now, we will obtain, obtain data locations from James Crumbly's Gmail account for November the 27th, 2021. Yes. Okay, did that help you identify what he, where he was that day? Yes. Okay. So we'll go through exhibits 104 through 107. Here's 104. Um, what do we see here? Uh, it shows James' location. Uh, it's near the gas station of the Meyer. Uh, uh, at Ray Road in 24. Okay, and we already talked about at this point in time he was working for DoorDash. Correct. And um, we always we already identified the fact that when there was an order ready, he would receive a text message from the DoorDash app. Correct. Okay, so were you able to tell what he was doing that day? He, yes. What was he doing? He was DoorDashing. Okay. So 9:37 a.m. indicates one position where he's at, and it looks like he's back home at 5:32 p.m. Correct. Here's exhibit 106. It's about 6.03 p.m. He's out of the house then? Correct. Okay. And 6.33 back home. Correct. Now, what about Jennifer's locations from that day? Were you able to obtain any idea where she was that day? Yes. Okay. This is exhibit 108. What do we see here? Uh, it's the purple dots indicating Jennifer's locations. Okay. So we have. Um, 2.29 p.m. to 3.32 p.m. in locations outside of the home, I would indicate what to you? She was at home. She was at, out and about. Okay, just to make sure I'm clear, on the 27th, we see James currently leaving home about 9.37 a.m., returning at 5.32 p.m., leaving again at 6.03 p.m., home again at 6.33 p.m. Correct. And the same day, Jennifer's gone from about 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Correct. Now, Sunday, November the 28th, this is exhibit 109. Tell us what we're looking at here. That is a GPS location for Jennifer on uh, November 28th at 12 p.m. Yeah. So she's obviously away from her home. Uh, do you know what's at this location? Yeah, that's where the horse farm is. Okay. Now, you say horse farm, you went through all of the digital evidence in this case. Correct. Okay, including the Facebook messages between James and Jennifer. Correct. The messages from James to anyone else or Jennifer to anybody else. Correct. Okay. Um, are you aware of James and Jennifer spending time at that horse farm? Yes, sir. Okay. And tell me how you're aware of that. Your Honor, I'm going to object to relevance. We addressed this, Judge. You addressed it in your earlier um, opinion as well. I think we, I think we did. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to allow it. I think your objection goes to weight, not admissibility. Thank you, Judge. Do you, how are you able to? To know that term. by how many times they talked about whether i'm going to the barn to do this or work on that this horse or take care of that horse yes okay um give us an idea of how many times they talked about they talked it was mentioned within their chats 86 times of going to the barn oh i'm sorry over what period of time that was from january to november from that conversation we're able to tell if they would go together or if they had a plan to do it? Both. They would go take care of one, go, go take care of a horse, or they'd meet up there together. Okay. Here is exhibit 110. This is Sunday the 28th at 2.07 p.m. This is at the Crumbly family home? Correct. Okay. So these last two pieces of the exhibit indicate that Jennifer Crumbly was at the horse barn from approximately noon to whenever she left, arriving home at 2.07. Correct. And that's the Sunday after that firearm, the 9mm was purchased. Correct. Now let's talk about James' data location points. Here's exhibit 111. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, it shows his location near the, at the Meyer gas station again. Okay, and tell us what he was doing that day from your review of the digital evidence. That day he was uh, door dashing again. So this is a data point at 1, I'm sorry, 8.56 a.m. Exhibit 112 is 12.45 p.m. Here's he's back at the house? Correct. Does he leave again? Yes, he does. Okay, here's 113. Exhibit 113 at 12.52 p.m. What do we see here? It shows him going away from the house. Okay. And Exhibit 114, what do we have here? Uh, at 5.13 p.m., he's back at the house. Okay. So all this tells you that James left at 8.56 a.m., returned at 12.45 p.m. He left again seven minutes later and returned 5.33 p.m. That's correct. Okay. Now I want to move on to Monday, the next day, Monday, November the 29th. 
I'm going to talk about a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer Crumbly from that day. So this is Exhibit 115. Um, Jennifer Crumbly at 8.23 a.m. on Monday, November the 29th. Are you at the barn? And then follow up just a question mark at 9.02 a.m. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So again, blue is Jennifer, <coughs> green would be James. James. Yes, sir. Okay. When you mentioned like those, those 86 times they talked about the barn, is this what you were referring to? Yes, it was. Was this a portion of what you were referring to? Correct. James' response was what at 9.05 a.m.? Uh, working on Billy. Okay. And did you come, who's Billy? Did you? I come to find it was one of the horses. Uh, uh, this is also part of 115. What did James send to Jennifer? He sent a photo, it's uh, the horse's legs. Okay, and Jennifer's response? Do the fronts too. So that's 9.21 a.m. on Monday, November the 29th. Um, what did Jennifer write to James after that? She asked him, did you call the vet yet? And then tell us to make sure you get back in between his heel balls. And James's response was, I did at 9.34, then fronts too, right after? Correct. And James wrote what at 9.35? He says, what exactly should I tell the vet? Type out for me, leaving the barn now. Okay. And Jennifer's response was what? Billy looks to have scratches slash mud fever. He's starting to stock up on all fours and concerned about infection. He's not lame, sensitive to the touch, and they go down when he moves. Is there an antibiotic I can get him on? We just put desitin and antibacterial on his legs today. Okay. And then she wrote what? She asked, was he stocked up this morning? Okay, so that was 9.41 a.m.? Correct. And James's response at 9.43? He responds back with, he was stocked up more in the back than in the front. In fact, the front didn't really look stocked up at all, so I launched them for a few minutes before. I put the stuff on it, and it took the swelling down a little bit, but I got that cream all over, you know, in between his heel bulbs and stuff like that. I'll call the vet here in a minute. Okay, then you wrote, talk to tax FYI, so I have no idea what I really just said. Yes. Jennifer, it made sense, LOL, at 958, and then James's response at 959. James responds with, I just talked to the vet, Carrie. Said she's going to talk to the vet once one of them get back in, and she will give me a call back. I explained everything exactly how you wrote it down. Good thing you wrote it down like that, LOL, for me. Okay, and the response was, okay, good, LOL. Correct. Okay, so this conversation regarding the barn and the vet started at 8.23 a.m. and it went until 10.15 a.m. Correct. Okay. Did you come to learn if a um, message was left for Jennifer Crumbly while this conversation was going on between James and Jennifer? Yes, there was. Okay. This is Exhibit 116. This will to me the volume. Hi, Ms. Crumbly. My name is Pam Fine. I'm calling from Oxford High School, and I'm here with Mr. Hopkins, who's Ethan's counselor. I was just calling to let you know that we just spoke with Ethan and had a really nice conversation. Um, one of the teachers had sent an email to the office just that she was concerned because um, Ethan, when she was walking around the room checking assignments, that he was on his phone looking at bullets um, and that sort of thing. So she just wanted us to have a conversation. We did. We said he assessed the shooting range with you this weekend and we were like, yep, you know, uh, you know, guns are a hobby for a lot of people and shooting ranges and that's perfectly normal. Um, and that we just wanted to make sure I uh, had a conversation with him about the things he searches at school um, and things versus searching, searching at home. Like Mr. Hopkins gave a good example of like if the teacher makes beer um, at home, perfectly normal and healthy, but can't be using searches for making beer at school. So we had a conversation, he was, he was great. Um, he was like, yep, I get it. So I just wanted to let you know that we did have that conversation with him and um, I don't know, about five minutes and he went back to class. All right, if you have any questions, you can give me a call. Otherwise, um, it'll be a great holiday. Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, so that was November the 29th, 2021. Did you find evidence that Jennifer Crumbly accessed that voicemail? Yes, she did. Is that depicted here in People's Exhibit 117? Yes. All right. um, could you find from the messages between James and Jennifer who picked their son up from school that day? Uh, Ethan did. I, I apologize. James did. Father. Here's Exhibit 120. 
Um, this is Jennifer Crumbly, you still working, 2.44 p.m. Um, James says no, waiting for her son, 2.47. Correct. Okay. In 119, this is later on, what does Jennifer write to James? She asked you, did Ethan tell you what happened today? And that's, that's the same afternoon that the voicemail was left? Correct. Okay. And James's response? Was yeah. And we're going to move on to November the 30th. And we'll go step by step from what you were able to discern from all of the evidence that you had to review. So in the morning, November 30th, were you able to tell what time the shooter was dropped off at school? Uh, after 7.30 p.m. or a.m. So you able to pull surveillance video for this? Yes. This is exhibit 122, 7.46 a.m. on the 30th? Correct. Tell us when you recognize him, please. He's getting, he got out of the car a second ago. He was the last one walking up. Right there? Yes. He was dropped off by his father? Correct. Okay. Exhibit 123, tell us where James Crumbly went after that. Uh, at 8.04 a.m. he was at home. Okay. And then one exhibit 124, where was he? At the horse farm again. Okay, so 9 to 4 a.m. So 7.46 a.m. he dropped off his son. He was home at 8.04 a.m. He's at the horse barn by 9.04? Correct. Okay. Do we know what time that Jennifer Crumley got to work? About the same time, 9.04. So this is what we're looking at here? That's Jennifer walking into her place of employment. This is exhibit 125? Yes. Okay. And this is November 30, 2021 at 9.04 a.m.? Correct. Now, do you know if she received a phone call shortly after arriving? Yes, she did. Okay. So, Exhibit 126, what do we have here? That's a from the call log obtained from her phone um, from the school. Okay, so we have a missed call at 9.24 a.m. on November the 30th? Correct. And then we have a return call at what time? 9.27 a.m. And how long is that phone call? That's five minutes, almost six minutes. So is that 5.43, that's five minutes and 43 seconds? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, next in the timeline, 9.31 a.m., what are we looking at here? That's a, um, the screenshot or a picture of the of a math homework, math sheet homework that the shooter had. Okay. So this was sent to whom? To Jennifer. To Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. All right. Exhibit 128, what's this? That's the full size image of it, the math sheet. So, did you come to learn there were actually two different math worksheets? Yes. Okay. And this would be referred to as the altered one? Correct, it is. So, this was sent to Jennifer Crumley at 931? Correct. All right, that's Exhibit 128. Exhibit 129 is what? That is appears to be an email of uh, the math worksheet. Here's exhibit 30. This is what contained in the email? Yes, that's the original. So this is this was emailed to Jennifer Crumbly at um, 9.32 a.m. Is that right? Correct. And the scratched out version was texted to her at 9.31 a.m. Correct. Now this is exhibit 131. This is at 9.33 a.m. So this is one minute after that original drawing was sent to Jennifer Crumbly, what are we looking at? Uh, Jennifer telling James, call now, emergency. Okay. And, and then she says again, emergency, two minutes later. And then at 9.38 a.m., what does she send? She sends the picture, the two pictures of the math worksheet. Okay. So the one that scratched out in, in the original, the correct that were sent to Jennifer? Yes. Okay. And James's response at 9.44 a.m.? James responds with, my God, WTF. And then what? Uh, vet not here yet. 
It's McElmurray or Kira's horse still waiting on bet. Okay. So we saw earlier that his location indicated that he was at the barn by at least 9.04 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And this was at 9.45 a.m.? Correct. And what did Jennifer write? Uh, respond back with, he said he was distraught about last night. James? He said, James says, we talked about it this morning. Then he asked, you talk to him, question mark. And what did Jennifer respond? Responds with, can you call? That's 9.57 a.m.? Correct. Okay. What does Jennifer write at 10.04 a.m.? She says, heading to a school, I'm very concerned. And that's at 10.04 a.m. on November the 30th, 2021. Correct. Now, did you learn that they both arrived at Oxford High School? Yes, they did. And did you learn approximately the time they arrived there? Yes. What time was that? About 10.30. 10.30. 10 6. This is exhibit 132, 9.36 a.m. We see James' location history that's still at the barn. Correct. Okay. And 134, this is the same surveillance uh, footage that we saw Jennifer Crumley arriving at work at 9.04 a.m. This is at 10.06 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And this is consistent with what we just saw in those Facebook messages when she wrote heading to school? Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 126. What do we see here? It's a call to the school, to the counselor from Jennifer. Okay, so she left at 10.04, then at 10.07, she called the same counselor who called her? Correct. And exhibit 131, headed to a school at 10.12. So that Correct. would be the timeline for that period of the day. Correct. So do we have an idea of, you said about after 10.30 a.m. that meeting occurred? Correct. Okay, and so is this what you base that opinion on? Correct, yes. All right, so what do we see here at Exhibit 135? What you see at the top of it is the horse barn, and then he takes a path down Gardner Road, and then uh, heads to the high school. Okay. So if I'm correct, what we just saw, the Jennifer arrived at work, well, first of all, the shooter was dropped <coughs> off at school at 9, or 7.46 a.m. by his father. Correct. He went to the horse barn at 9.04. Correct. Jennifer arrived at her place of employment about the same time, 904. Yes, sir. Okay. And she received a phone call at 924. Correct. Then we saw the messages sent from her counselor and the phone call from her, her counselor and the messages thereafter with those two drawings. Yes, sir. And then the Facebook messages at, um, directly after to James with, with those two drawings. Correct. Okay. And this shows when he left the horse barn and about the time he arrived at Oxford High School. Correct. Uh, did, he, did he stop by his house before he went to the meeting? No. Did Jennifer stop by the house before they went, she went to the meeting? No, sir. Did they go in one car or separate cars? They were in separate cars. Okay. Now, we had discussed this particular aspect of the case in a separate hearing um, some time ago, and there was an original belief that they arrived in one car. Correct. Okay, you, you came to learn that they arrived in two different cars. What's That's correct. Leading? Again, it's just, just foundation. So. Tell me what happened. When I originally was watching the video, the system that the school has, it doesn't, it's not continually recording. It only records when there's enough movement in the frame. So if someone, if, if they're too far of a distance away, it's not going to record, even though there might be somebody walking across the parking lot, the sensors don't pick it up. And it didn't, once I saw the second car, what I thought was the first car, pull into a parking spot, the next thing I saw was just two people standing in front of it. So I assumed that they had come out of that car together. So keeping with our, our timeline here, 10.29 a.m., um, we have a call log of, what do we see here? Uh, James calling Jennifer. And how long was that phone call? Seven minutes and 16 seconds. Okay. And based upon what you found on the video and the messages and data locations before they arrived at the school? Yes. Now, you were able to um, pull the surveillance footage of both vehicles arriving and their movements while inside the Oxford High School, at least that were contained on surveillance video. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So this is Exhibit 137. I'm going to play this. And just so we know at the bottom of the screen here, 
we have a description of the camera, what it's looking at with the time. Correct. So this is 10.36 a.m. on November, November the 30th, 2021. Correct. And this, what are we looking at right here? That's the parking lot of the school on the north side of the school. or whenever you're able to give us some context of what we're looking at. I come to find out that that's Jennifer pulling up right there in that car. Okay. And then there's James and Jennifer walking up to the school. Right here? Yes. Sure, this is James Denver Crumbly in the Oxford High School that day? Yes, okay. that's in the office there. They're being directed around to counseling. And the bottom of the screen there is 1039 a.m.? Correct. So it just might actually be a good time for a short break if the court was inclined to take one. You want to break your That's fine, All right, so um, I'm going to let you step down, but you can't discuss your testimony with anybody. All right, so just about a 10 minute break, okay? All rise for the jury.
on every time. I know. I remember who you are. Thank you. So, all right. Calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 222-279-989-FH. So we're going to bring the jury in, okay? Mm Seated. You are still on your own, okay? All right, go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Okay, so we were on uh, November the 30th, 2021. This is at 10.39 in the morning. You identified both James and Jennifer Crumbly in Oxford High School. Right. Okay. So this was the surveillance video pulled from that day and that time? That's correct. clock there that says 1242 that's incorrect correct it never changes okay right so the actual time is in yellow at the bottom of the video it just turned 10 40 in the morning that's correct yes okay. thank you Did you come to learn who this person was that greeted James and Jennifer Crumley? Yeah, it's a school counselor. Okay. That just skipped now from 1041 to 1052 a.m. Same view, same exhibit. Who did we see leaving the office? That's the shooter. And that's 1052 a.m.? Correct. This is James Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. And they're walking out of the counselor's office? Correct. Back towards the front office. At one point in time, James Crumbly was holding a white piece of paper. Now it appears Jennifer Crumbly is holding that. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And he just took it back from her? Correct, he did. So they leave the building 10.54 a.m. on November 30th. Correct.
So this is 1057 in the morning? Correct. Okay. Let me know when you see James Crumley's vehicle leaving. Here it starts right there. Okay. It turns to its left. Okay, did James Crumbly stop by his house after that meeting? No, he did not. We'll move on to, so we'll go to exhibit 140. This is a location data at 11 a.m. Where at? At the Meyer. Okay, that's November 30th, 11 a.m., and that Meyer is where? To the west of the school, just down the street. Is that the Meyer you told us about earlier yes, it today? Is. Okay, yes, so it is. that's the Meyer you went to. On that same day? Correct, yes. Okay. And um, do you know what he does there? Um, I know he, he sits there for a while, for a little bit. I think he starts door dashing. Did he log on to door dash yet at that point? Yes. Right. Here's 141. This is 11.24 a.m. And this is the same surveillance footage of Jennifer Crumley's employer? Correct, coming back to work. So he's back to work at 11.24 Correct. Okay, so this is Exhibit 142. I'm going to go to a Zoom version here. This is November the 30th. This is the DoorDash search warrant return? Correct. Okay, so Part you can... I'm sorry? Part of it, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, and so this is just depicting the November the 30th date. November Correct, 30th yes. date. Okay. And so he logged on to DoorDash at what time? 11. Okay, so yeah. that's the time he actually logged on. Correct. Correct, okay. So going back to this version on Exhibit 142, there are no logons prior to 11 a.m. that day. That's correct. Okay. All right. And in fact, we see his first um, message was 11 a.m. Correct. Right. It's exhibit 80. Exhibit 143. Now, the time here at the, the top corner, that's 11 a.m. to 11.19 a.m. And this is a map that's been created that depicts DoorDash pickups. Is that right? Correct. Pick up and delivery. The route he took, yes. Okay. And if you would refer back to that DoorDash search warrant return, Exhibit 142, you were able to tell that he had four different orders that morning until the shooting? That's correct. Okay. So this location history depicts what? Again, that's the path from um, the Google search warrant return we used to follow the path down to where he picked it up to where he dropped it off. Okay. And at any point, did he stop by his house? No, he did not. This is um, 11.19, that's when he got his second delivery? Correct. Okay. And exhibit 44, 11.19, 11.46, what do you see here? It shows where his last, his first drop off was to where the second pickup was. Okay. And then where he dropped it off. Did he stop by his house then? No, he did not. Next door dash order is 11.58 a.m. Correct. Exhibit 145 here, this is the, the GPS locations? Yes, it is. From Google, what, do we, yes. what do we see here? Uh, his second drop off in the south, the bottom part of the picture to where he went back up to the mire at the top side of the picture and dropped it off. Did he ever stop by his house? No, he did not. This is 12.51 for a door dash order, November the 30th. 1251, that's what you told us was when the shooting started. Yes. Exhibit 146, what do we see? Where his uh, third drop off was at the bottom of the picture in the pickup end um, of the fourth trip to the drop off of the fourth trip. Okay. Did he ever stop by his house? No, he did not. Now, what's the first relevant event in either James or Jennifer's devices after the shooting occurred at 1251? Uh, an email was sent out. Okay, this is exhibit 141, or a portion of it. This is what? That's uh, the email header from um, the Oxford Community Schools at uh, 109 p.m. Your Honor, I believe this is exhibit 147. 147. Oh, what did I say? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right, 147. Thank you, 147. So this email was found from a search warrant return on James Crumley's email? Correct. Okay. And it was sent from Oxford Community Schools to James underscore Crumley at yahoo.com. That's correct. Subject line was active emergency at OHS. Correct. Okay. And this was at 109 in 52 seconds in the afternoon. Correct. Okay. 
Now, were you able to tell from his data locations where he was when he received the email? He was, um, at, he was going to the Meyer, yes. Okay, so this is 1.11 p.m., so 1.11, 38 seconds, about a minute and a half later, his GPS pinged at that same Meyer that you went to? Correct. Okay. That's exhibit 148. Now, after that email was received at about 1.09, 1 1.10 p.m., who did he call? He called Ethan. Okay. He called the shooter? Yes, the shooter. And that was at 1.13 p.m.? Correct. And at 1.17 p.m., he tried to call him again? Correct, he did. Okay. Neither phone call went through, is that right? That's correct. It's exhibit 136. Does he leave the Meyer parking lot? No, uh, he does for a little bit, yes. Okay. So at 1.17 p.m., we see a lot of different green dots here. Is this the first data location that shows that he left the Meyer parking yes, lot? Yes, it is. So that was after he received the email and after he called the son twice? Correct. Okay. That's exhibit 149. And does he call anybody else at that point in time? Yes. He tries to call Jennifer. Okay. That's exhibit 136. And do we know Jennifer left her work that day? That's correct. She did. Okay. I'm just going to show a clip. Clip here, this is exhibit 150 at 1 18 p.m. So this is after he had the 57 second phone call with Jennifer. Correct. Okay, we saw that James left the Meyer parking lot at 117. Did he go home then? Yes, he did. Now, first, did he call, did he receive a phone call from Jennifer? Yes, he did. Okay, so this is 1.19 p.m., and how long was this phone call? 10 minutes and 19 seconds. Okay. Exhibit 151 is GPS location from 1.20 in the afternoon, November the 30th? Correct. Okay, so that's right after he received that phone call from Jennifer Crumbly? That's correct. Okay, and that's, this indicates that he was at the home? On East Street, yes. Now, at this time, do we know if Jennifer was on the move? Yes, she was. Okay. But she wasn't home yet? She wasn't home yet? No, she was not. All right. So this is Exhibit 152. Where is she at, at uh, from 118 to 120 p.m.? Uh, that's her employer. She uh, Square Lake and Telegraph, south of here. Now, while she was on that phone call with the defendant, with James Crumbly, did she send any text messages? Yes, she did. This is Exhibit 133. What did Jennifer Crumbly write to Andrew Smith? Well, first of all, did you learn who Andrew Smith was? Yes, I did. And who's that? That was her boss at work. So this is at 1.23 p.m. According to the records that you reviewed, was she still on the phone with James Crumbly? Yes, she was. What did she write her boss? She said, the gun is gone and so are the bullets. He replies with, I'm praying everything is okay. She says, OMG, oh my God, Andy, he's going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. Okay. And that was 1.23 in the afternoon on November the 30th. Correct. Now, did the defendant receive another phone call from his wife after they hung up from that 10-minute phone call? Yes. Okay. Going back to the phone log, this is at 1.30 in the afternoon. It looks like a three-minute phone call between the two. Correct. Now, this was at 1.30 p.m. with a three-minute phone call, so it lasted about 1.33 in the afternoon. Correct. What did James Crumley do after he hung up with his wife? He called 911. This is Exhibit 154. Okay, I'm not really sure. I'm at my house. There's an active shooter situation going on at the high school. My son goes to high school. I have a missing gun at my house. I need an officer to come to my house right away, please. Okay, I'm not going to be able to send anybody to your house right now. So they're, they're, okay. they're on the active shooter situation right now. I understand that. There's another shooter at the house. I have a missing gun at my son is at the school. And we had to go meet with the counselor this morning because of. Uh, Something that he wrote on a tax paper, and then I, I was in the down and I saw a whole bunch of cops somewhere, and I made sure I, I, I wanted to get to the high school, so something was going on the high school, and then somebody told me that there was an 
the shooter, and then I reach home just to like, find out. Okay. And I think my son took the gun. I don't know if it's him. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, you should really freak him out. My son's name is Ethan Crumbly, C-R-U-M-B-L-E-Y. Ethan Crumbly. I'm going to put you up for just one second. I'm going to have to talk to the commander and see if I can do anything for you. Okay, Mr. Crumbly. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Crumbly. in the afternoon on November the 30th? That's correct. And sir, if you know that was before the name of the shooter was made public? That's correct. Now, at some point, were, was James Crumley contacted by law enforcement? Yes, it was. Okay, you know if both James and Jennifer Crumley went to the Oxford, or Oakland County Sheriff's Office, Oxford substation? That's correct, they did. Okay. This is exhibits 155 and then 156. These are location points. 1.58 p.m. for James Crumley, where is he at? That's the actual, the location of the substation. Okay, so he made the phone call from his house at 1.34, and he's at the police station at 1.58? Correct. All right, and this is Jennifer Crumley, she was there at 1.59? Correct. <clears throat> now, sir, we talked in the beginning of your testimony about um, the multiple phones that were recovered and that you conducted analysis on. Do you have a chance to review the forensic downloads of the other phones as well? Yes. Okay. Now, during the course of your forensic investigation, did you find that on a phone associated with Jennifer Crumbly, what we refer to as a burner phone, an alarm set for December the 4th, 2021? <clears throat> Correct. It was. Okay. That's 157. Oh, they're back home at one at 2.30 in the afternoon at 157. Exhibit 157, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so Jennifer Crumbly, 2.30. James Crumley, 2.30 afternoon. Correct. Okay, so now I'm moving ahead to December the 4th. This is exhibits 159 and 160. What are we looking at here? That's the screenshot um, on the left side and then the showing the alarm set on the right side. Okay. Now from your review of all of the forensic evidence that you had, did it appear that Jennifer Crumley would leave her phones on throughout the night? That's correct, she would. Now we talked a little bit about how the cash images were found of the nine millimeter handgun, but the message wasn't found, and how you have an ability to occasionally obtain deleted content. That's correct. All right. Um, were you able to obtain a Facebook thread between Jennifer Crumbly and somebody named Brian Mosh? Yes, that's correct. Were you able to obtain any particular messages that were deleted? Yes. I'm gonna to show you exhibit 161 and 162. These have been admitted. 161, what are we looking at here? Uh, the first box indicates that uh, the message was unsent. Uh, and the second one um, from Jennifer Crumbly is, we're on the run again, helicopters not sure where to uh, message you on December 2nd at 131. When you say unsent, why is this significant to you? It says she recalled the message back. And this is from a Facebook message? Yes. Okay, so this is after the shooting. This is Thursday, December the 2nd, 2021. And she wrote, we're on the run again. Helicopter is not sure where I'll message you. Correct. Okay. Exhibit 162, later on Thursday, December the 2nd, 2021. Did you find another deleted message? Uh, yes. And tell us what that is, please. Uh, the original message was, we're fucked. And then that was also unsent. And because it says you unsent a message in the, the red X, does that indicate to you that it was deleted? Correct. 
Now, sir, you reviewed all of the defendant's phone call history. Is that correct? Correct. At any point from the time that James Crumley left for that piece of paper on November the 30th, 2021, to the time the shooting occurred, at any point in time, did he call any doctor, hospital, or medical provider? There was no indication of that, no. Now, you reviewed his entire web history as well, James Correct. Crumley's. At any point, did you see him researching nine millimeter handguns? No. So the screenshot that was on his phone that was deleted, that was sent from his son to him on November the 8th. That's correct. <clears throat> now, earlier, you described the video that you put together of the shooting. Yes. And you spent, I asked you earlier, and I think your response was too many as far as armors. Could yes, you, sir. for context, though, to lay a foundation for the jury, could you give us an idea of how much time you actually devoted to this? To that particular video? Yes. Oh, um, I would... I'm going to object 40 to, to 50 hours. I'm sorry, I'm going to object to relevance. Just, relevant. The jury is going to see the actual video in a few days. Okay. This witness was the, the individual to put over 100 camera angles together. To do that, he had to, to watch an awful lot of footage and he also had to, to, to parse out certain activities of students before, during, and after the shooting. The video itself is synced together. There's portions where it skips, and we have to explain why. There's no sound in the video. Okay, okay. well, you can, you can ask him that then. You can definitely ask him that. Why? It's, it's not one complete video going from beginning to end. No, like it was it's not... a series of different camera angles. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's it follows the shooter's movements uh, from the different cameras, correct? Okay, but you also had to aid in the identification of the victims. Yes, I did. Okay, but how how did how was it that you did that? Uh, by where they were standing. Yeah, I'm going to object to this as well. I don't know how this is relevant either. Judge, this is a this is a homicide case. Well, it is a homicide case. I'm going to allow it. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, by where they were standing, um, I was asked. What, how, what they were doing just prior to the shooting, the victims were. So how are you to put that together though? I don't understand, what do you mean? How is it that you use that information to help identify the other investigators, who was who? Did you, let me ask you, did you learn what certain individuals were doing directly before the shooting? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the group of students you identified as, as Hannah, Kylie, and Riley, did you know what they were doing? Yeah, they were just standing there Dancing and laughing, it appeared, and choking. All right, thank you. I've got the Do we approach her? Sure. Microphone here. Yeah, could you guys turn the mic off?
All right. Um, we're going we're gonna to continue tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning for reasons that I'll explain to you more later when we meet. Um, so um, much like I said at lunchtime, you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone because you're in the middle of testifying right now. So I'm going to have you come back in about quarter to nine tomorrow, and we'll start right at nine o'clock tomorrow morning with cross-examination. Okay. All right? All right, so you can step down. When, when we excuse you, we are doing uh, work. We were here uh, quite a while last night, but I, I don't like to make you wait while we're doing other things. So um, we're, there's a lot of moving parts, so I uh, want to let you go, all right? Um, I need to tell you that during the trial, you should not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. Do not go on social media, do not post, don't do research, don't discuss the case with anyone. Um, we're gonna start up at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Does anybody have any questions about the schedule or anything in general? Well, we'll start at nine, five to nine. Okay. I'll, I'll not be either. Here. Um, no, but we'll start at nine. So you guys, you guys are really good today about coming on time. I appreciate that. So I, you know, sometimes they, you know, they want to set their camera up, and there's always, you know, I'm here, but so we're moving a lot of people around. All right. So um, in the court, and you have to go through security. There's all those things. So. Um, it takes some time. So we'll vote all day tomorrow. We're making really good time. I can tell you that. Uh, anybody have any other questions about the schedule? Any other questions about the schedule? Uh, oh, I forgot to order you to stay healthy. All right? <laughs> all right. And um, we'll start up again tomorrow at 9 o'clock. All, right? all right? All rise for the jury. Is on way to court to address the issue with guests. All right, you may be seated. Um, right now? Yes. Oh, yeah, they can go. I'm going to let the jurors go. Okay. There are no jury instructions issues anymore, right? No, we agreed a few months ago. Right. Yeah. yeah.
Good afternoon, Your Honor, David Williams. Good afternoon. Would we call this a motion? Is that? Judge, I think it is. It's an oral motion. Okay. Your Honor, before we get started, I'm just going to place my objection on the record that this is being handled. You're going to put your, that this is being handled? Yes, especially in front of the media in the middle of a trial, when this is obviously very likely going to be put out in the public, Your Honor. Well, I do have a concern about that. Judge, I was not certainly asking for it to be in front of the media, but... I don't know how to make a record without that. Well, we've learned that. It's called 8.119. But... May I judge? Well, I, I guess I'm wondering um, during the course of the trial if there's uh, any kind of a stipulation that could be agreed to. Certainly, I'm happy to discuss what my request is, Judge. Well, um, Ms. Lehman, would you be willing to have a, a discussion with the prosecutor's office? I, I can't, um, I have to hold public courtroom. Correct, Your Honor. I'm, I do not want to impact uh, your client or your case in any way by doing so. So I'm, I'm weighing the, the rights of the parties, so. I would be more than happy to speak with the prosecutor's office about this. Just, I'm going to be very brief. I think the situation could be temporarily taken care of with with a stipulated order, but I, I don't know if that's satisfactory or not. I'm reluctant to impact the rights of the parties during the jury trial. I mean, Judge, my request is pretty straightforward and it's I, pretty time limited. Well, I know what your, your request is, but I'm, I'm concerned about um, statements that might be placed on the record, right? Aren't I concerned about that? I am your own. Okay. I mean, Judge, I think it's appropriate for the record, and obviously the jury's not present, that's why they're not here. Um, but I understand the what the court's raising. I'm not. All right. Well, I know you do. I know you do. I know you understand my concerns as well. I do. Um, hold on just one second, Judge. I'm asking you if there's an, uh, another uh, method during the duration of the trial, which is about the next week or so. That's exactly it, Judge. Okay, so I'm asking if you and uh, defense counsel I, I could enter into draft, a stipulation. A draft order, Judge. There was a draft order provided, Your Honor. It is not time specific. It appears to be kind of a blanket so time period judge, well, i can set this for a motion the second there is a verdict right judge, in, fact, in fact judge i think we'd be willing to have the order expire by its own terms upon a verdict we're just talking about during the pendency of the trial okay the client shaking his head i don't i don't know if he... In theory, I could ask the prosecutor to file a written motion, but that doesn't help you either. And Judge, I'm happy to do that. Okay, Your Honor, my client is not willing to agree to the order. Okay, so you... It's basically restricting his ability to speak to people, Judge. I mean, it, it's, well, I'm more, I'm it's most, a complete revocation, I, except I'm, for counsel. I'm, I'm most concerned about him being able to talk to you. Right, and, and absolutely, that's not part of what we're asking. I mean, Correct. Judge, if, if the order gets entered, we're asking that the communications be limited to only counsel and legitimate clergy during the rest of the trial. That's my request. 
We're talking seven or eight days. You can talk to his attorney. You can talk to legitimate clergy. Okay, so he, if he doesn't agree to it, then um, uh, the, the prosecutor is going to make their motion, right? And I have advised Mr. Humbley of that, Your Honor. I would, I would propose that there could be a, a different order with a restriction and not a complete revocation. Um, obviously, the, the prosecutor's office is reviewing communications. They would know whether or not the order was violated. And at that point, if the court needed to take action, then the court could take action. Because it's not just about violations going forward. It's about the conduct that's already happened. Well, I, I understand that. I understand that. It, it, it's so hard to understand because there's a big old sign right there, right? On every call. Yeah. Every single call. Yeah. I'm, I'm judge, right. if there's not an agreement, I'd, I'd like to just make my motion. It's, it's fairly brief, Judge. So, Ms. Lehman, what's what's his position? Okay. Your Honor, okay, he's I not don't... agreeing to the order. Okay. Well, does he know that that in ten minutes there's going to be a an article about it? Does he know that in ten, maybe eight? I, I can't ha I'm I'm not permitted to have a closed courtroom unless we're proceeding with a closed hearing under 8.119 and as I sit here right now I don't know if this qualifies so May I speak with Mr. Lewis? Yeah, you can, you can step out if you need to. Yes. Judge, I think we've reached a resolution. That sounds good. <coughs> um, Judge, I think I can just briefly make a record. This is obviously the order is going to become public. The agreement is going to be that um, 
Mr. Crumbly's communications will be uh, revoked, but not his ability to do research or otherwise participate in his own uh, defense. So not just communicating with counsel, but his ability to read or get other information. Okay. Simply communication. And so, that's, that's going to be a stipulated order between you and Ms. Lehman. Correct. All right. And did you say that that order would expire upon a verdict? Yes, Judge. Okay. And, and, I, it, and perhaps what, it should go without saying. One? What if there isn't one? Well, I, I think. Would you like? I mean, we can address it at the time. Okay. I, I think the issue is once there's a verdict, a lot of the issues just fall away. Okay. Um, and I judge it should go without saying, but uh, I hope the court will encourage Mr. Crumbly that the, the conduct that's got us here. I, I think I already did through his attorney okay. on several Thank occasions, uh, both in, pri in private meetings that we've conducted. When I say private, I mean with both uh, the prosecution and the defense. And for the record, I've also addressed you. I know you have. So I gave out free legal advice, Mr. Williams. So if someone can take it or not take it. Right? So, so I'll sign the stipulated order. Good. I didn't sign it. Can I approach the clerk, Your Honor? Sure. All right, um, my staff is going to e-file the order, all right? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, is the jury gone? Yeah. All right, so we'll start right at 9 o'clock tomorrow with um, your cross. Okay. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Recording stopped.